Hey everyone, um, I'm going to attempt to demonstrate a simple DES example in MM1Q in Excel, and you will see why, um, even though we used Excel very successfully for Monte Carlo simulations, for simulations that are evolutionary, like DES systems, um, it gets much trickier. Uh, you can think about how you would do it in a programming language. It might be a little bit easier, but we'll actually learn some techniques. We'll learn the underlying algorithms and logic um, behind simulation softwares like Arena, like Simio. Um, but I will show you some basic ways to try to do this in Excel. And then also, again, the limitations um, and challenges. So let's simulate for now the first five parts. Um, each part that comes in, we're gonna have an inter-arrival time. Those are gonna be independent and we're gonna have a process time that gets generated. These are also going to be independent. Um, and I'm going to use, um, you can look this up if you're interested. We'll learn about it later in the semester. Um, I'm gonna use the inverse transform method of random number generation. But for now, let's just take it at face value that if we want to calculate, if we want to generate a number that's distributed exponentially with a mean of 15 minutes, the formula for this is negative 15 times the natural log of a random number. And so we can generate um, different inter-arrival times for these parts. And then similarly, the process time, again, is exponentially distributed with a mean of eight minutes. So we'll say this is negative eight times. So we've generated, for each part that comes in, we have generated an inter-arrival time and a process time. Now let's pay attention to what's happening on the clock as each of these parts comes in. So the first part is coming in at time t equals zero. The start time is again t equals zero because it's the first part. And the end time is going to be the start time plus this randomly generated process time, right? The next part that comes in is going to be this previous arrival time plus the inter-arrival time. Um, and let me do it this way. It's tricky with inter-arrival time because obviously um, this is the time in between. So either you don't generate it for the first part or you don't generate it for the last part. So I'm just going to skip this first part and say that this arrival time is the inter-arrival time plus the previous arrival time. The start time is going to either be when the part arrives, if the drill is free, or it's going to be when the previous part leaves, if the drill is busy. So this is going to be the max between this arrival time and the previous part's end time. And so in this case, the previous part leaves at 2.5 minutes. The next part comes in at four minutes, so it's going to start at four minutes. And let me just refresh and find an example. In this instance, the previous part doesn't leave until 13.2 minutes, but um, part two comes in at 12.5 minutes, so it's going to be waiting, and there it's going to start a little bit later. The end time, however, is still going to be the start time plus the process time. And for each of these parts, we can calculate a wait time. Um, obviously, for the first part, the wait time is zero, and then machine idle time is the first part, so it's also zero. In this instance, the wait time is going to be the start time minus the arrival time, right? So if it doesn't start until the previous part um, ends, if, if the, machine is or the machine is busy when this part arrives, there's going to be a wait time associated. Oops. Here we go. And then this is an instance where uh, there's no wait time. And then the machine idle time is going to be this start time 
minus the previous end time. So if there's no wait time, that means the machine was idle in between parts. And if there is a wait time, that means that the machine went directly from part one into processing part two. So there was no idle time. And we can bring these down. And now we have wait times, we have machine idle times for the first five parts. Um, that's great and all, but we get into the problem. How do you simulate until 72 hours have passed? Because this is evolutionary, depending on what random numbers get generated here, right? Your simulation is going to terminate at different, um, with different number of parts coming in. But let's pull this out. When I did the same model in Arena, I got 299 parts out. So let me click and drag this down to, let's say, 400 parts, just to cover, our, you know, be on the safe side. Right, so now we know that, like, we probably have run the simulation long enough. But where does the simulation end? So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to make this a manual calculation. That way these random numbers don't change until I tell it to change. It's not gonna change every single time. And we know that the simulation ends at 4320 minutes in. So let's scroll down and see where on the clock. 4320 happens here, right? So part 292 leaves. And then before part 293 arrives, the simulation is going to end. So in this case, this simulation ends in between these two parts. We've got 299, sorry, 292 parts in, 292 parts out, and then the simulation ends. If I recalculate this time, let's see, 4320, happens here. It happens in between, like while the 300th part is being processed. So in this instance, we have 300 parts in, but only 299 parts out. We still have one work in progress when the simulation terminates. And every time we recalculate with new random numbers, we're gonna have uh, a new termination point. Let's see, 4320 happens here. So after 277 parts in, 277 parts out, then the simulation terminates. Um, and so doing it this way is tricky in Excel because it's evolutionary. There are ways to do it in Excel um, that are less tricky, and that would be by following the same algorithmic logic that softwares like Arena and Simio use in their, in their underlying programming language. Um, but this is just a really easy way to, to try to lay it out. The other problem that we have, again, because this is evolutionary, is calculating things like the number in Q at any given point in time, right? So if the wait time is zero, we can say, okay, that's easy, the number in Q is zero, right? So at this instance, the number in Q is zero, zero. Here we have one part in Q but it leaves before the next part comes in, right? Um, but here we go, let's look at this. We have obviously one part in Q, but what about part 13? How many parts are in Q when part 13 comes in? Part 13 comes in at four, sorry, 242. And at that point in time, part 11 is still being worked on. So that means that part 12 is being, is queued. So we have now two in Q, and then obviously it goes to one in Q and then um, zero, then it gets processed. And we have zero in Q again. Here we have one in Q. Here we have, see, this arrives, ooh, right as this departs. So actually, there's still only just one in Q when this one arrives. Uh, okay. 
This one arrives. This one is being, this one's queued. This one's queued. This one's gone. So there's two in queue here. When this part arrives, 315, this is queued, this is queued, this is queued. There's three in queue, but you have to check and see. And this is definitely not the best way to approach um, doing a DES simulation in Excel or any other programming language. We will learn um, a better method later on. I just wanted to show you the limitations of um, Excel and how, you know, doing uh, evolutionary simulations, DES simulations, is much trickier than Monte Carlo simulations. And we didn't even get into how to calculate the summary statistics. If we can't even really figure out how many are in the queue at any given point in time, it's tricky. How are you going to calculate the average number in queue? The wait time is a little easier because uh, we are doing the wait time by part. So we can calculate the average wait time. We can calculate the idle time. And then if we know when the simulation terminates, we can calculate the percent um, of time that the resource is being used versus not being used. So we can calculate some statistics this way, but um, we'll learn some better techniques later on in the semester. In any case, I hope you found this video helpful, and if not helpful, then at least interesting.